ada Hayyala as-salah Hayyala al-falah Hayyala al-falah إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يبد الله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا سيدنا عبده ورسوله وقال الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون Respected brothers and sisters, we begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise him, we thank him, we glorify him, and we bear witness and testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's servant and last messenger. To begin, my dear brothers and my sisters, I would like to share a story or an incident that we find from the seerah, in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was finally about to take the Hijrah. He was finally on his path to Medina. You see, at this point in time, the Muslims were persecuted, they were boycotted, they were tortured, all sorts of horrible things happened to him. And so the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, along with his companion on this journey, Abu Bakr, they sought the path and they went. And at this time, as they were actively going to Medina, they were in pursuit. There was people from Mecca, the Quraysh, the pagans, who were actively pursuing them and it was their goal to kill them. That's what they wanted to do. And so at some point in time, at some point during this journey, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr, they sought refuge in a cave to evade the enemy, to hide from the enemy. And as they were hiding here, as they were in this cave, trying to cover themselves, at some point, the enemy came so close to them, so close to them to such an extent that Abu Bakr actually said, Ya Rasulullah, if they were to merely just look down, they would see us and perhaps they would be killed. Right? It's as if like you're on the first floor of Laz and someone's on the second floor. If they look down, they can see you. It was that close. And it's at this point in time, at this point in time, where they are standing face to face with the enemy, impending death. Yet, what does the Prophet Muhammad wasallam say to his companion? He says, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Do not grieve. Do not grieve. For indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. It is this, at this point in time, where it seems like the odds are stacked up against them, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ displayed something that we would describe as a beautiful level of tawakkul, a beautiful level of reliance and trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's on this point here that inshallah I want to speak about. And I hope that today what I wish to do now is to enrich our understanding of this concept of tawakkul, trust in Allah, and to hopefully also give us some measures by which we can start to implement it within our life. And I'll tell you this, dear Muslim, in tawakkul, quite frankly, it's like having a cheat code in life. It's like having an almost guarantee that whatever it is you're striving towards, whatever it is that you're working towards, surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deliver it to you. But to begin, we want to first start off with defining it, understanding its importance. And many, many verses in the Quran, to this extent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So put your trust into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are indeed believers. So the first point here is that you are not able to perfect your faith. You're not able to perfect your iman until what? Until you bring into your heart a sense of tawakkul, a sense of reliance and trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of your affairs. That's point number one. Many, many verses that speak to this effect that if you are believers, then put your trust into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see, this tawakkul, this idea of tawakkul, trust in Allah, it's a sense of complete reliance, complete reliance. In fact, Ibn Rajab al hanbali a great scholar, he gives us a definition. It is complete reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a complete sincere dependence from the heart in your endeavors, in pursuing whatever interest you may, may have, whether that be dunyali interest 
or after the interest. And also, safeguarding yourself from anything that might be harmful to you and helping you achieve your goals. That is what tawakkul is. And one thing to note here as well is that tawakkul, quite frankly, it's something of the spiritual heart. But it's very, very hard to actually see how tawakkul manifests in your limbs. We'll get to that. But most importantly, tawakkul is something that begins here in the heart. It is a very powerful, powerful spiritual state. Right? And we need to understand that. And so, one common misconception now that I would like to address on the point of tawakkul, on the point of trust, is that, does that mean I can simply sit back and not take my means? Right? Because everything is guaranteed. Right? Alhamdulillah, Allah, the results are guaranteed. Why do I need to do anything? Why do I need to do anything? But in fact, this is not what tawakkul is. And our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, gives us a very beautiful analogy to explain this concept. He gives the analogy of a bird. And he says in a hadith that if you were all to depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to trust in Him the way He deserves to be trusted, He would certainly give you provision as He gives to the birds who go forth hungry in the morning and they return back to their homes with the belly full at dusk. Subhanallah. So you see the birds here. They leave, they leave their nest in pursuit of their risk. But they also have trust in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely, surely deliver the risk to them. And you see another layer of this hadith. It's a very beautiful point. These birds, when they leave, they're leaving their children in that nest. And these nests, what do we know about these nests? They're not some very strong, rigid structures. Quite frankly, if there was a strong thunderstorm, these nests might be destroyed. Yet despite knowing that, despite knowing that they still leave, they leave and they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of their affairs for them. You see, you and I, similarly, we might find ourselves in a very vulnerable situation. I know a lot of brothers and sisters who are international students. They've left their homes. They've come to this country to study. And you've left your parents back at home. And perhaps you're worried. Perhaps you're stressed. I want to be able to support them. I'm not in a position to help them right now. You have all these concerns. But what does tawakkal tell you to do? What, does, what kind of sense of peace does tawakkal give you? It's knowing that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that tawakkul truly manifests in its most beautifulest of forms. And when it comes to tawakkul, oftentimes you have three groups of people. Three groups of people. The first group is a person or the group that relies only and entirely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without personally asserting any effort towards their goal. And as we described this earlier, to give you an example, that's like the individual who walks into an exam without studying. And he says, Akhi, tawakkul ala Allah, I'm gonna pass inshallah. That's the type of person. It's a foolish person. This is not what tawakkul is. You can't walk into an exam blind and say, Allah's got me. That's not how that works. Right? So that's group number one. And I'm sure many of us sometimes we fall into this category. In fact, there's actually a narration at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The people of Yemen, they came to travel. They came to Hajj actually. And they came without sufficient provision. They didn't come with material, supplies, resources to get them through that actual pilgrimage. And so, when they were asked, why did you do this? They said that, Allah is sufficient for us, He will provide for us. And it's actually on this point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah and take your provisions, take your means, and indeed the best provision is those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's group number one. Group number two is the type of person who takes the means to achieve the desired outcome. So now you're putting in the efforts, but you only rely solely and entirely on the means itself and not on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see with this point here, sometimes we fall into this subconsciously. No one actually does something thinking that X, Y, Z reason, the means is the reason why I achieve my particular outcome. But at the same time, sometimes we do. For example, let's say we're sick and we took some medicine and because of that medicine, we were healed. And we say, Alhamdulillah, it was a time of or whatever I took that healed me. When in fact, it is actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who caused that medicine to heal you. You have an example in the Quran itself. The son of Nuh, alayhi salam. You see, 
the people of Nuh were commanded to go onto the ship, to go onto the ark, and that is the only way you will be protected from the punishment of Allah. And so Nuh, alayhi salam, he called it to his son. He said, oh my son, burn the ship, for you will have no protector except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what he said? He said that I'm going to seek refuge in a mountain. I'm going to seek refuge in a mountain. He thought that the means of this dunya, the fact that if he goes on a high mountain, he will be protected from the flood that's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what he believed. And what happened to him? He was destroyed. Right, so that's point number two. Those who take their means, but they believe that the means are the only reason as to why you achieve your outcome. And group number two, three, inshallah, and that's, I hope that's where we all fall, is the group of people who take the necessary means to achieve the desired outcome, but they also place their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, the Anbiya and the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and the companions are living examples of this. Right, for example, at the Battle of Badr, at the Battle of Badr, they did not just remain in their tents and say, Allah will send them the Malaika and they'll take care of it. No. In fact, they were actually discussing strategy. They had to actually take like, some areas of the world, they, they position themselves in a very strategic manner. Right? Throughout his entire life, the Prophet Muhammad was constantly plotting and planning, taking his means, taking his measures, so that he won't be successful. Right? Similarly for you and I, that's exactly what we must do. Maryam, may Allah, may Allah have mercy on her, may Allah be pleased with her. Similarly in the Quran as well, when she was suffering from the pains of labor, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell her? Right? Shake, the, shake the, the, the date tree, the dates will fall and it will nourish you. Right? So she took her means and she trusted that these dates will actually suffice her in, our, in her affairs. So this is the third group, and that we hope inshallah most of us fall here. But quite frankly, sometimes you and I, and I hope that inshallah we're all in the third level, but sometimes we waver in our tawqid. We have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then we're worried about the outcome, we're stressed about the results. And this is our last point that I wanted to make, which is the aspect of not only is tawakkul, complete trust and dependence and contentment on the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also submission to His timing. Submission to when that thing will come to you. Because for many of us, many of us, we do take our means, but deep down inside us, it's like, when is it going to come? When am I going to get this job? When am I going to get this co-op placement? When am I going to figure out the prospects for marriage? When am I going to figure out my financial situation? These are all things that constantly plague your mind. Wallahi, it does. And in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran that indeed, mankind has been made hasty. Mankind has been made hasty. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa on this line, he also says that every single one of you, Every single one of you will have his du'as answered. Every single one of you will have his supplications answered so long as he is not impatient. And he says that, I have supplicated, but I was not answered. I have supplicated, but Allah did not give me the result that I wanted now. But here's the thing, O Muslimin. You do, you, all, all, along this journey, you realize that all this time I simply needed to submit to the timing of my Lord. You see, Imam Joseph, rahimahullah, he says that Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was in prison, when he was thrown in prison, if he focused only on getting out of prison, he would not have been able to benefit from all the refinement that was happening to him at that point in time. You see, delay is not denial. Delay in your thing, the goal that you're wishing for, is not a denial of it. Quite frankly, for many of us, the answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not no. It's simply not yet. It's not yet. And for many of us, when pursuing a blessing, when we become fixated on a certain goal, because of this we start to neglect, the other blessings that are already in our life. When we get this kind of tunnel vision, we narrow our focus. The only thing that I'm focused on is my co-op. And then you forget about everything else. You forget about everything else. You see, sometimes when, you're, when you find yourself in a situation, when you find yourself in a hardship, the best thing for you actually is to you know, stay within that journey. Because sometimes the refinement that happens within that journey makes you a much better person than the actual destination itself. Right, so you must understand that the delay is not denial. And that surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the outcome you want. But you just have to trust this time. You see Musa alayhi salam, when he took his people to liberate them from the oppression of Pharaoh, they eventually came face to face with the sea. They were standing before the ocean. And now at this point, Musa alayhi salam, he took all his means. He did everything he possibly could. Now at this point, it's beyond his control. Beyond his control. And you know what he said at that moment? The people behind him, his followers were saying, Ya Musa, what's going to happen to us? We're doomed. And Musa alayhi salam at that point, he said, No, nay, indeed my Lord will surely guide me. He will surely show me the way. So sometimes for you and I, we just simply need to wait for the sea to split. Because inshallah, it will. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us an understanding.
and to bless us and to allow us to be patient with this decree and to also implement the local into our lives. And with that, we take a break. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ويسأل المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وداه ثم أما بعد. Respect the Muslims for the second half very quickly. I just want to touch on a few things that we can hopefully look to or try to implement in order to actually develop a sense of tawakkul, a sense of trust and reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first point that I want to make is that we can try to inspire ourselves through the stories of the prophets and the righteous before us. Inspire ourselves by looking at how they actually displayed the waqtul in their own lives. Take a look at Ibrahim alayhi salam for example. He was a person who was completely outcast by his community. Some very similar to the Prophet Muhammad His entire community turned on him and decided that in order to get rid of this person, we're going to kill him and we're going to throw him into a fire. That's what they decided. A fire that no eye has ever seen, a huge fire. And you know what Ibrahim alayhi salam said at this point in time? Before he, was, before he was thrown into the fire, it's recorded in Sahih Bukhari that the words that he uttered was what? Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakeel. Sufficient as Allah. Sufficient as Allah. Subhanallah. That was the words of Ibrahim a.s. Sufficient for us is Allah and He is the best disposer of our affairs. Or you have the example of Ayyub a.s. He was someone who was afflicted with a lot. Lots of poverty. He became very sick. He lost his children. He was suffering with so much. Yet, he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking him to alleviate him of his burdens and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviated him of those sicknesses. You have the example of Yunus alayhi salam who cried out in the belly of the world. He said what? La ilaha illa ant subhanak inni kuntu min al And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered him, protected him and took him out from the belly of that world. So many, so many examples. But here's the point. You see these anbiya, they display a level of tawakkul in the hardest of circumstances. You and I, are asked to split the work in very easy tasks, in tasks in which the stakes are not so high. We're asking you to put the work into Allah before you go and write an exam. But you're not being thrown into a fire. It's very easy for us to do so. And subhanAllah, even look, today we see an example of this, the people of Palestine, and all those Muslims who are being oppressed. Allah, videos after videos, they're being blown into smithereens, and yet in those videos they're saying, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakeel. Right, so inspire yourself. The stories of the righteous inspire yourself through examples that are actually happening around you. And through that, inshallah, you can start to develop a sense of the work into your life. Point number two is obviously dua. Dua and trust in Allah is lived like this. You cannot separate the two. As the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not be that individual who was making dua and then eventually you stopped because you got frustrated with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when I first saw this hadith, I was like perplexed. I'm like, how is it possible for someone to make dua and all of a sudden they stop? I told I did it myself. There was something that I desired, something that I wanted. Eventually it wasn't working, so you forget about it. And I came across the hadith and I said, SubhanAllah, truly this is the nature of man. We get frustrated, we become hasty. So continue to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him for whatever it is. Ask Him. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's aid, you can move mountains, you can. And another specific remedy on the point of making dua is the concept of istikhara. It's a very broad concept, I don't have too much stuff to get into it. But point being, if you are never, ever looking for clarity, if you are ever looking for help in a decision that you wish to make, you can do this prayer. You pray two minutes of prayer and you make the dua istikhara. And then you pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates that effort for you. Perhaps, perhaps you have two jobs to choose from and you're unsure. So you pray istikhara. You say, okay, you know what, my heart is leaning towards the job at Deloitte. You make that decision and you pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates it for you. So that's point number two. Point number three is for you to have firm resolve. Firm resolve. You see the Muslim this is a very interesting point. And I think that it speaks to a philosophy that we should have towards life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَإِذَا أَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكِّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ So once you make a decision, once you take an action, put your trust into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, consider a student now, to make it relevant to all of us. This student is someone who's constantly wavering on the study plan for the exam. They say, okay, I have an exam coming up. You made a plan. But then in the middle of that time, you say, ah, actually, I already know chapter one really well, let me, let me bounce to chapter three. But then as you start in chapter three, you start doubting yourself, wait, I actually need to go back to chapter one. And you start flip flopping, you start bouncing around. You say, maybe should I, should I read my notes or should I look at the textbook? Well, a lot of people do this all the time. I see it. And they spend 
eight hours trying to figure out how to study, and then you have the next day is the exam. Alright? So once you have a plan, once you've made your mind to something, you've taken your knees, put your trust into Allah and commit to it. That's not to say, don't get confused, I'm not saying be stubborn. That's not what we're saying here. Being able to adapt is a good sign of a humble believer, yes. But generally speaking, when you have a set plan, when you have a set means, stick to it and stay firm in that resolve. And inshallah, the last point, the last point that I'll give to you in order to help you develop your tawakkul, your trust into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is for you to actually remember Him. In a simple ayah of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the believers are those who, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, they feel a fear in their hearts. And when His verses are recited unto Him, their iman increases and they put their trust into their Lord. You see, the Muslim need to give you a simple example. If you are about to give your friend your, the keys to your car, you are going to give him permission to drive your car, would it just be any friend that you found off the street, someone you just met today? Absolutely not. At least for me, absolutely not. It's someone you know, someone you trust, someone you know, they have their jeans, alhamdulillah. But not someone that does something shady, right? You take your needs. So similarly, when it comes to entrusting the person with the existence of your life, how are you going to have that trust if you don't know him at all? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Al-Hayy al-Qayyum, Al-Wali, Al-Mutayy, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbar. If you know these things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you internalize these meanings, Wallahi, you feel like you can conquer anything and everything. Right? So immerse yourself in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you start putting your heart, your attention towards Him, Wallahi, your, your affairs for you will be at the same time very, very easily. Very, very easily. And so the fruits of Tawakkul that I can put on this point is that as you're navigating this life, as you're navigating this life, there's a sense of peace, a sense of contentment, a sense of tranquility that comes into your heart because you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has your back. Right in the ayah that I begin with, the first ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how after the Prophet told Abu Bakr, Inna Allah ma'ana, that indeed Allah is with us. He says right after that, that tranquility came and settled into their hearts. Right? So you take your means, do what you need to do, play your parts, and then trust in Allah, and surely you will have the sakinah that is required to navigate the affairs of this dunya. So with that, I conclude, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us understanding of this beautiful concept of tawakkul, to allow us to be amongst those who truly put our trust into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a result of this, to make us among those who are loved by Him. Inna Allah wa malaikata wa yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhal ladhina amnu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Jama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa mika hamidu majid. اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد سبحان ربك رب العزه يا مسفور والسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين اقيم الصلاه اللهم صل وسلم